And I'm going to talk to you about this goal I have, as you, as you heard there summarized pretty nicely. Um, how can, it's not so much how do you tell a better story, which is what I was doing as a journalist for decades, to how do you make a difference with communication? And a lot of that, as I've learned in recent years, has, is more through, um, more through engagement than through storytelling. Story, you, you can enthrall someone with a story, but you can repel them even as you enthrall them. Because if you're telling a story that says you're pro-nuclear when you think about global warming and the person is uh, rapidly anti-nuclear, even though they care about global warming, that can kind of cut against you. The, the more effective your story is, the more you're actually in, um, antagonizing that audience. So the only way you can get around that is a lot of listening, a lot of um, uh, patience sometimes. And we're in a very impatient communication environment right now. Uh, you can see here, uh, my question, my one of my hashtags on Twitter is, can we make uh, reality cool? And can you see the slide? I just want to be sure people are seeing the slide. Yes, we see the slide. OK. Hold on. It is, and I don't know how to remove it. <laughs> I couldn't I'm resist sticking in a certain to, feline. Uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live. That's not, I'm not a If cat. there's anyone here who did not stumble into the uh, kitty. I, I can I can see that. Um, it is. It's and, kind of a remarkable thing. I don't know thing. how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. So uh, what I'm trying to reflect here is, again, we live in a very complicated, noisy, distracting communication environment. You can still get your delivered newspaper at your, on your sidewalk step, but that's becoming less and less how we're hearing about the world and how we're sharing information about the world. Hold on. So my journey, again, has mostly been as a journalist. Um, I didn't come into the world to be a journalist. I went to Brown University, grew up in Rhode Island, studied biology, wanted to be a marine biologist. I was inspired in the 60s as a kid by Jacques Cousteau uh, and uh, Eugenie Clark, the, uh, the shark uh, behavior specialist. And I just wanted to uh, pursue questions about nature. And as I got into college, I realized, well, you know, I'm actually more interested in the story of science than in doing the science. It's really hard to get a PhD. And it wasn't just the difficulty of it, but I kind of am interested in the big picture. And most of what you do in science, at least in those early days, is focused for years on some very discrete problem. So uh, as you heard earlier, I've been, I covered the water supply for New York City, many regional environmental issues here after I got out of journalism school. Then I went down to the Amazon, started writing about endangered species like the sturgeon right there in the Hudson River as well. Even got to meet the Pope briefly at a meeting at the Vatican on sustainable humanity, sustainable nature. And down the bottom, you can see a picture of me. It's not a selfie, I guess, if you don't take it. So. There, there I was being photographed, taking a picture of the Pope. That's the kind of world we're in right now, multidimensional. So in, the, in those days, it was all fairly straightforward. I would write, do a lot of reporting. I would um, and assess what I've learned, compare it with what other, other people are writing, and then turn around a story. And here was my first big story on global warming it was in 1988. So that was the same year that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was launched by the UN. It was the same year that Jim Hansen, uh, who is a Columbia veteran and a NASA retired scientist, uh, warned the world about climate change. And I thought I was on, I was getting into track, you know, writing big magazine pieces. And I thought my future was going to be doing that. I still have a, I still have a copy of it here. And it's kind of an artifact now, um, tattered and fraying. But I learned later, things are complicated. You know, back then I was writing for a magazine, a science magazine, an award-winning science magazine that was selling cigarettes on the back. And just let that sink in for a minute. So here I am telling the story of global warming on the front cover while we're telling the story of tobacco on the back cover. And we hadn't yet, the magazine ban on advertising of cigarettes, tobacco hadn't yet happened. And I don't think in the newsroom in 1988, we were having these deep discussions about, you know, the morality of that. It was much later in my career that I started to assess <clears throat> kind of these mixed messages. And that, that's part of the complexity of um, how do you have an impact. I went to the New York Times in 1995 
still very much a print organization at that time. I uh, reported, started reporting on every aspect of the climate problem from the treaty talks, foundering even as Gore and, and um, uh, Bush were fighting it out in the Supreme Court, uh, reporting about issues you've heard recently related to what the Trump administration tried to do at EPA and other agencies. But back then it was Bush administration, essentially putting the science in the background when the science did really did not fit the message of policy. I went to the North Pole, which was very consequential for me as a reporter, not just because it was the first time a New York Times reporter had gotten to the sea ice at the North Pole, flying there with scientists, but because of what happened there. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Right here. If that's too loud, uh, turn your volume down. What you're seeing here was video I recorded while I was at the North Pole. The sound is the sound of the ice. You can feel this, the, the uh, chunk that we're on actually starting to fail a bit more. Probably hairline cracks up the, um, towards okay. the helos there. So does that mean we should back up? No, not yet. You can always <laughs> jump over a crack. <laughs> so hopefully that came through okay. The, the, the lessons that I learned there were, remember, this is 2003. I was there as a print reporter. My job was technically to write stories. So I was taking notes on a pad. When you're at the North Pole, where it's 20 degrees below zero, you have to use pencils, not pen, because the, the ink in the pen freezes. That's one of the minor things you learn. But I also learned about this potential to have connectivity with readers in a more real-time way, not just by waiting and writing a story and come when I got back. Uh, I had a satellite phone. And there was a uh, young editor on the, uh, the, the, the web desk of the Times, which was nothing like what it is now. And she suggested that we do a reader forum. And this was a novelty at that time, 2003, but we worked it out. She, I was on the phone from the North Pole with her satellite phone. She got in reader questions by email and I was answering them from the sea ice at the North Pole. And I really got stuck on that idea of um, a conversation with readers, not just a unilateral expository relationship. And that, that grew into many other things going forward. In 2007, I started a blog at the New York Times called Dot Earth. And the blog emerged because the issues that I was focusing on were complicated. Climate change is probably the most multifaceted question ever, other than the big question of sustainability writ large. And I found that news articles about climate change, I always felt they always kind of didn't quite capture that complexity and dimensionality because to write a story for the New York Times, unless it was some big special report, you'd have to fit it into 1200 words if you're lucky, 700 words, 800 words for a sort of a front page news article. And that leaves out so much of the uh, nuance that I felt a blog felt like a better way to kind of to have the reader come along with you on a journey of exploration, a journey of learning. Again, very different than the old New York Times model of, or, or think about Walter Cronkite for those, I'm sure many of you grew up with Walter Cronkite, like I did. That's the way it is. You know, that was how we used to have a relationship with, with viewers and readers. And this is very different. And as you can see there, that's my, in 2007, I got onto Twitter. You can see my Twitter handle over on the left side there. I've been on Twitter ever since, despite the dynamics and the noise and what Trump did, um, there are ways to use these social media platforms that can be incredibly, uh, truly constructively engaging and lead to new insights for me as a journalist and new relationships with um, audiences as well. And I, I really got, caught on technology, you know, some of this is just sort of colorful, cool, animated stuff, but it's also a way to tell stories and data. This was a package that a uh, paper had done on water stress in the Middle East and using satellite data. And this became a very exciting moment for me because I just felt that using the blog, interacting with audiences uh, in that two-way uh, method, it felt more like, um, I felt like I was, I was uh, at the leading edge of something. And then boy, I'll tell you, it started to change as you'll, 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 anyone who's been involved with social media recently will understand. 
And this is what I mean when I say the complexity of the simplicity of an old story. Like, here's another one I'll just show you. Um, a cover story in a magazine. This was a mystery story about a Russian scientist who vanished. Once upon a time, Vladimir Alexandrov did work. He vanished. There's a big mystery. Um, the, the good news about being online was that I could convey complexity. We could talk, I, even like in that case, not knowing what happened with Alexandrov, I could have readers along for the ride. The bad news is you're in a landscape of, of noise uh, and it's very hard. It's as if our audiences have now had to learn a new skill, which is how to sift through this information environment to get a sense of what's reliable and what isn't. Uh, even within the New York Times, that can be a challenge sometimes. So here is just some websites that had ballooned around the climate issue. And you could basically pick your information based on your biases, as opposed to every, everyone in the country listening to Walter Cronkite or John Chancellor or a couple other people and getting a general description uh, of the uh, what's happened in the world. It led me to, quite often I've ended up feeling like this photographer, this is a videographer. I, I took this picture at the end of the climate talks in Copenhagen, 2009. And it was a very dispiriting moment where the talks had broken down despite Obama's best uh, efforts and others. Um, so there was just this sense of doom and gloom. And I think about this a lot every time I feel discouraged about the state of online media now, but there are ways forward. And in the context of the conventional writing I've been doing, you know, I still write books. I still, there's still a big and important place in this world for expository traditional storytelling. And I keep at it. Uh, the, the most recent books are at the right. The Human Planet came out last year with my good friend, George Steinmetz, a great photographer. My book on weather history with my wife, Lisa McKaylee, who's an environmental educator, and then back in time. I came to the Earth Institute here at Columbia this past, just before, <laughs> I say BC, before, before COVID. Um, in 2019, Alex Halliday, the new director of the Earth Institute, I convinced him that there's a feature of the Earth system that the Earth Institute wasn't yet interrogating. The feature is this new information environment with all the noise, with all the potential to connect us live, someone in the Amazon, someone at the North Pole, to create communities with special interests, no matter where they are on the planet. You know, it's incredible power here now. And also when you think about remote sensing data and the other ways to analyze the streams of data all around us, super exciting. But also, as I said, super uh, frustrating because the systems we use are mostly designed to distract us or addict us, not to inform us and, and connect us. And the idea is let's, let's dig in on this. And so we've been doing this Initially, it was a lot of uh, activities, traditional college style activities. I got artists together with scientists, have a young Zambian uh, intern, Brighton Kaoma, who is at Columbia getting a master's degree, which he now has, uh, teaching radio because he had learned radio skills as a 14 year old in Zambia and, and workshops on writing and the like. Uh, then of course, the, the coronavirus hit us like everyone. And it was like hitting a wall, so many of our norms exploded. We were forced into screen world. Those who had never used Zoom had to figure out in a hurry how to make it useful and uh, not overwhelming. And that felt also like one of those hammer blows like that again. But almost immediately, I started picking up signals of that upside of connectivity, the upside of science communication. And one of the first ones was the result of the pandemic at, at Johns Hopkins University. There were two people in the applied engineering department. You can see their Twitter handles at the left, Edgeheng Zhang and um, Lauren, right, Lauren Gardner. They had, oh, not Lauren Gardner, I'm sorry. I don't, oh, I, I have to look up her name. She was the, the, the head of the applied engineering. Back in January, when those first hints of trouble were coming out of Wuhan, and there was no real, source for data, no real sort of go-to place, they created it. They launched a website in, in January, pretty much overnight. They knew it was going to, it was a rough draft of what they wanted to do. And they knew the data flowing in were gonna, were a mix of quality. 
But that became a vital portal in those early weeks, especially in the absence of, of you know, assertive, concerted government effort. It, it became a vital portal for tracking where this virus was uh, surging, where it wasn't surging, what it was doing to hospital capacity. And it had views in the billions, in the billions with a B, within a couple of months. And that, so that excited me again. Uh, there are people like uh, Sarah McNulty there at the left, who's at University of Connecticut. She's a marine biologist. But for several years, she had already, this is before COVID, she had created kind of a network of mostly young scientists using Skype as a way to connect with classrooms anywhere. And they're, it began as a hashtag on Twitter, Skype a scientist. It was basically a way of raising your hand and saying, I'm a marine biologist in Connecticut. I'm here to be in your classroom, your high school classroom or your junior high or elementary school classroom in Arkansas or in uh, somewhere in Asia. Uh, uh, we can work that out through Skype. And this became her moment because again, everyone was now scrambling to have that same capacity that had already been established. Um, we, on the right, there's uh, Seamus Khan, who's a sociologist at Columbia. He had, he dove in in a different way. He started building a curriculum online on how to be an ethnographer, uh, ethnographer, how to, as a student at any age, how to take note of the world around you in a way that historians in the future will be able to draw on as reliable information, how to, how to, how to chronicle this amazing moment in history. And by creating an online syllabus that could be used by anybody, he was also exploiting this connectedness around us in a fresh way. Fantastic. They've since shut down because what happened after a few months was everyone jumped on and said, let's do it this way, let's do it that way. Um, a friend of mine, Dan Hammer, who had worked in the Obama White House in technology, he had been working, uh, building an organization called Earthrise that connected journalists with satellite data or satellite imagery to help enrich their stories. For example, when China was building those islands and reinforcing those islands in the South China Sea, making reefs and islands, uh, journalists were scrambling for images and they were able to provide them. He took that in a new direction and now it's earthrise.media, uh, earthrise.education. And he has students, in this case, early last year, just before and then during the pandemic, students in Massachusetts and in uh, Iowa were sifting through satellite data of the Amazon rainforest and they helped to identify areas of, of, of mining invasions in Indian reserves. And then that data and those images ended up in a big uh, Reuters uh, wire service story on the threatened tribe. So none of those entities could have done it themselves. The Reuters doesn't have anyone around sitting able to do the data sifting. Students were engaged through their, through their screens that otherwise can be pretty repellent in helping Indian, Indian tribes protect themselves in the Amazon rainforest. That model also completely excites me. I ended up launching our own webcast at Columbia in March, uh, right that first week essentially of lockdown. And one of the first sessions I did was on this project because I was trying to spread word to others that uh, imagine all these teachers who are trying to find ways to engage their students through a screen. Here's a great way to think about doing that. So this was the first real day of the webcast um, and it was kind of fun. I had a, a, a biology professor in, in Nebraska on the right and a friend, an internet pioneer, Jeremy Zalar in Brooklyn. And we just, I just turned on this thing called StreamYard, which is a live streaming website and we started going. Since I've done that, this has become a significant chunk of my work week. Uh, and the week has evolved these pulses. Mondays are what I call thriving online. The sessions are like the one I just described about Skype a scientist or the Amazon data work. Uh, they're building skills and spreading skills that can help anyone advance human progress uh, online uh, amid all the complexities and noise and distraction. Uh, Wednesdays are more about policy. One of the first sessions I did again, illustrating the potential of this, this screen, this horrible thing that we mostly are frustrated with. Um, 
the week that um, Prime Minister Modi in India initiated a, a lockdown for 1.2 billion people, which kind of backfired because what it did was it set, set hundreds of millions of people in motion right when you wanted the virus to be constrained. People were rushing back to their villages and the like. And I got in touch with some people in Bhopal, city in India, and we had a live session on the food issues that were raised as the lockdown proceeded. So I had, a, again, a live conversation with people around Bhopal who were working together as a network to help bring food to uh, the, uh, the most um, vulnerable, vulnerable people, the deeply poor in India. And one of the people in that call, the, the guy in the lower left, was actually in his car driving a food shipment to a slum neighborhood while we were on the call. And you can see it was a global conversation. There were messages coming in from all over the world as we were having that conversation. Fridays are about news and social media. Tomorrow's is about the te Texas deep freeze. So if you tune in at 1 p.m. at 12.30 p.m. tomorrow, we're having on folks from Texas and elsewhere in the United States who are very expert on the issues related to how do you keep a grid going when it's uh, in stress mode by either extremes of heat or or cold. Um, and in this case, uh, the session was on some of the bigger challenges about how, how do you, well, th actually the session that you're looking at here uh, centered on Jeff Schlegelmelsch's work. He's at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia. And he's a real genius at conveying to people how to manage your information flow when, as you, I'm sure many of you found yourselves essentially doom scrolling, as you've probably heard that term, which entered the dictionaries last year for the first time. And he says, as he said here, I've, I've observed over the years, whether it's in agencies or emergency operations centers, when we're dealing with uncertainty, as we all have been this year, rather than pivot ourselves to manage with uncertainty, we try and cram more and more information into our brains, trying to connect the dots but the information is just more noise. So he, he was passing along insights on how to, how to manage that part of your life, the information part of your life, so it doesn't drive you crazy and you can actually get things done. Sundays uh, ended up being a part of my side, my side work. I'm a musician, a songwriter. I used to play with Pete Seeger, who was a good friend here in my part of the Hudson Valley uh, for 20 years. And, uh, so Sundays I used to recharge my own batteries and soul and um, build community around music and poetry. And as you can see, people are calling in from California. In that case, one of my, the, the uh, young man on the lower left, Joseph Pupe, was, uh, he's a songwriter in Lusaka, Zambia, uh, there with a um, sheep farmer from Massachusetts and a, uh, an educator in Texas and someone from the Catskills. And we're all you can't sing together easily at the same time online, but you can certainly trade songs and build relationships. And it's been a wonderful uh, part of, um, I think it's an essential part of communication is taking breaks and finding ways to um, shift gears. Uh, there are these general patterns, I think, that I hope some of you can take away from this. One of them is to just, again, pause amid all the flow and think about the things you care about and then look again at social media. I, I hope people don't pull away from it because of the problems. That, that just would make it worse. And as we've seen, it can be really a problem. Disinformation, misinformation. And, and you can build community. You can kind of cut through the um, chaff and the noise and the, uh, the meanness, which is there in spades, uh, using hashtags or just searching carefully for terms that can connect you with people. The thing I like about Twitter specifically is it's mostly people. There are bots there too, obviously. Uh, Google, if you search for um, peanuts on Google, you'll get manufacturers. If you search for peanuts on Twitter, you might get someone who's working on an invention related to uh, harvesting peanuts more sustainably or the like. So Twitter is a dynamic, interesting place to, to explore. And I loved this hashtag that emerged about eight years ago. I am a scientist because and it conveys a really important thing about storytelling, which is put, put the technical details at the back end. If someone says, what do you do? You don't say, I use, I, uh, I use a, 
you know, I use a spectro spectrophotometer to assess ions uh, coming from the sun. I'm not even sure if that's something you, anyone does. You say, I love astronomy. The sun is an endless mystery. I'm a scientist because, and if you fill in that blank, that's a way to move forward and engage someone who might otherwise just zone out. The other thing is to step back from the easy narratives. You know, there's a horrible tragedy in Paradise, California, that largely was cast by the media as about climate change. And here I am, you know, I've been writing about climate change since the 80s. But I also write a lot about disaster risk generally. And this neighborhood in Paradise, when you look at these images, you realize um, several different questions and stories emerge that aren't really about climate change. As you could see, the trees around this neighborhood hardly burned. The houses burned. As one fire scientist said, this was an urban fire in a forest. It was not a forest fire. And that leads to a whole new set of stories about, well, why did that neighborhood, why was it immolated? What's with the houses that didn't burn? Were they just lucky? Or did they have uh, better insulation and fire safe uh, constructed methods? What would the zoning be like to make it safer going forward? And you can have all these big stories about climate change, but this problem is more about local issues. And that that helps to clarify, concretize uh, paths forward for a community other than just sort of taking the most vague approach. And it's, as I said, it's two stories. California, just, I don't know if anyone's on from California. There was a research paper in uh, a few years back that has projected that 650,000 homes are projected to be built in areas of high wildfire severity risk in the next 40 years. And that says there's a lot of work to be done with or without global warming, there's work to be done and there's an issue to resolve. Here's a, this is, Hi guys, so I'm gonna teach this you is a quirky thing. Long lashes. So the first thing you need to do is grab your lash curler. Let me, you know, I am not a TikTok person. I do have an account because I poke at it once in a while. And TikTok is mostly people doing weird dances and stuff. Instagram, I still don't really understand uh, unless you're a photographer like George Steinmetz who has a million followers. But here, this girl, um, she did something really that I think that illustrates beautifully how to flip the script and how to think even of a, something like TikTok as a creative platform. So this looks like she's doing a makeup um, routine. Whoops, let me go back. Hi guys, so I'm going to teach you guys how to get long lashes. So the first thing you need to do is grab your lash curler, curl your lashes, obviously. Then you're going to put them down and use your phone that you're using right now to search up what's happening in China, how they're getting concentration camps, throwing innocent Muslims in there, separating their families from each other, kidnapping them, murdering them, raping them, forcing them to eat pork, forcing them to drink, forcing them to convert different religions, if not, or else they're going to, of course, get murdered. People that go into these concentration camps don't come back alive. This is another Holocaust, yet no one is talking about it. Please be aware. Please spread awareness. And yeah, so you can grab your lash curler again. And Hi, guys. Sorry. So you get the idea there. I, quite an extraordinary way to flip the script. And it this also attracted the attention of the conventional media. And she was a, profiled in the Washington Post and elsewhere. And I think that says, again, amid all the noise, amid all the commercial commercialism and and chaff um, there are ways to have an impact i'd like to follow up with her to see what she's doing these days on facebook 10 years ago a young man in halifax nova scotia he was a high school student actually no a college student um, in an art school had an assignment to create a an online piece of art and he created what looks like a facebook conversation but if you look closely and later, if this is recorded, I think it will be, you can poke at it and read. It's actually a conversation between and among endangered species of wildlife. It starts with tiger saying, totally screwed, like 3,200 of me left. Sad face. Panda, uh, I don't mean like, like good. I mean, like, like, I feel you, bro. I'm around 2,500 right now. And it goes on and on. And it's not just funny, it's tied into a World Wildlife Fund campaign for um, wildlife awareness and conservation. So that shows again that humor, creativity can kind of tame some of these platforms that we take for granted as 
being pretty mean, meaningless these days. Data can take different forms. What I really love about this particular um, uh, animation, and it's not clicking forward more, but um, whoops, you get the idea again. What you're looking at is the same number of people. Let's try it again. You can see there very briefly, there it's the same number of people in different forms of transportation. When they're in cars, they take up a lot of space. When they're in a tram, they don't. And that's basically an infographic. It's, it's data visualization done very creatively using um, imagery. Shows some of the other potential for how to communicate science in ways that are engaging. And that was the Toronto Transportation Commission a long time ago. Um, music and the arts play a big role as in, in, in interfacing with science. Um, there was a young cellist at the University of Minnesota, you can see over there on the left, who um, teamed up with a scientist there to turn data, climate temperature data into a cello sonata. Uh, that was about six years ago. A song for of our warming planet. Now, no one knows that this makes a difference. It'll engage some people, it might not engage others, but the experimentation is vital if we wanna figure out what works and what doesn't. If you don't try things, you'll never know. A colleague of mine who goes by the hashtag carbon wrangler on Twitter because he is involved with capturing carbon dioxide out of the air, Julio Friedman, he's also a very talented pianist and he took on some of this uh, climate data and created his own little composition, which you'll hear now, going from 1400 through till uh, recently. It certainly demonstrates that something has happened. Climate has changed. It's changing still. And it's one way to convey that understanding using different neurons in our brains that might have it sink in in a different way and lead to different attitudes. Oops, sorry. There are some scientists around the world who've been playing, turned into visual artists. Uh, Ed Hawkins uh, in England uh, began taking that same historic data of climate temp temperatures around the world, different latitudes or um, global average temperature, and using color patterns to show the, the trend in temperature from colder to hotter, as you can see here. And now that has spread since to ties. The tie in the middle is worn by Jeff Berardelli, who's a Columbia master's student, who's a mid-career student, who's a CBS uh, meteorologist. You've probably seen him on CBS Sunday morning, you'll probably see him for this storm and certainly for the Texas uh, storms. And recently the Economist adopted this same pattern for a cover of the magazine. Better yet, other scientists have then play with this. So via the internet, via social media, Alex Radke, another uh, a scientist in Germany, began to, he noticed that, uh, that Hawkins data only goes up to now, right? It, from 1850 through 2010 or 2020. And Radke began taking modeling results showing the different tracks for temperature going forward in time. They're obviously uncertain, but you can use color shadings to designate that. And he's sort of take, he's play, playing forward with the same data to see if we can, it can capture our understanding better on what climate is likely to do under different emission scenarios. Play with others is another part of this. Uh, one of my biggest jobs at Columbia is to get disciplines talking to each other, to get uh, artists and the humanities talking to the sciences, getting the social sciences to talk to the physical sciences and biological sciences. They're, there's amazingly durable walls in universities. Same thing at corporations, same thing at the New York Times. The business desk hardly ever talked with the science desk. So the business stories on climate wouldn't really be informed by what the science reporters know. The more we find ways to cross those lines to um, lubricate conversations between and among academia and communities, communities at risk, communities of the business world, the better off it's likely that things will be. Getting to the fine arts too, 
Art can do different things. As you saw earlier, it can be really kind of functional, trying to educational, like on temperature. Uh, famous pieces of, of art, uh, like uh, Robert Smithson's uh, Spiral Jetty and Great Salt Lake. Uh, you know, they just are there to evoke some of some, one of the artist's uh, passions or ideas. Recently, um, Stacy Levy, an artist in Pennsylvania, began uh, leapfrogging from what Smith, Smithson did. His piece is pretty intrusive. It actually, you know, involved bulldozing a big pile of gravel into the Great Lakes. She has built these spiral uh, wetlands, which are taking pollution out of the pond. The, they're living uh, reeds and other species of water plants that float. They, they have an artistic aesthetic, but they also function to withdraw pollution from the landscape. Many ways to go forward with visualization and art. There's a seismic sound laboratory at Columbia that is using sound to show us patterns of earthquake activity in the planet uh, to understand how dynamic this planet is. There are other earthquake scientists I've met, uh, Roger Billum uh, at Colorado and uh, Rebecca Bendick years ago. Roger is one of the famed um, seismologists identifying enormous risk through the Himalayas for great earthquakes well before Nepal's disaster and Pakistan's in 2005. And he and, and she created posters to try to convey in local languages, in iconography that can be understood anywhere, how to mix cement that's more likely to stand up to an earthquake or less likely. And I, I find that aspect of what they do, you know, there's, he doesn't have to worry, he has tenure, he doesn't have to worry about uh, what he does with his career, uh, but finding ways to have an impact in communities through innovation and communication feels implicitly like something scientists would benefit from doing. There are organizations that are getting this. Uh, the American Geophysical Union used to be a very stodgy, it's 100 years old, uh, array of thousands of earth and ocean and climate scientists. And they would publish their papers, sometimes get in the New York Times because someone like I, like I would write this story. Like, then they are now trying to be more meaningful to communities. They created this enterprise called Thriving Earth Exchange and the, the website is there where if you're in a community that faces chronic flooding or um, soil depletion, erosion, or earthquake risk, and you need a hydrologist or a soil scientist or a seismologist, this, this creates an interface through which communities can find someone. It's kind of like match.com, but uh, for science and communities. Uh, it, one of the realities is it takes time. You can't just parachute a scientist into a community, have that person give a PowerPoint presentation or do it by Zoom, go home, and then have everything magically be more resilient. Uh, they have found consistently it takes time. You have to build conversations to create the trust so that the data can inform decisions and build a more resilient future. I've tried to innovate myself. You know, uh, my office at Columbia, I haven't been back to it in almost a year. And I don't anticipate going back to it anytime soon, even, even with vaccination advancing. So I built one online that has some pretty cool rooms. Um, one of them, you're floating in a, in a kelp garden, a kelp forest. One of them I created after the inauguration when I hosted some musicians for my Sunday show on the steps of the Capitol, doing it safely and, and you know, with some order and care. And uh, it's created an environment that's a little more uh, f flexible and dynamic and engaging than Twitter uh, Zoom boxes. So, and I do think that demonstrably works. Oye.co is the website. And actually anyone can go there and sign up for a free uh, trial kit, just to kind of test it out. Someday at Columbia, wherever you are, we'll all be back to, I shouldn't say back, will be in a situation where we can now can reconvene, where scientists can engage physically with it through an open house at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory across the Hudson. Uh, the biobus can roll again, which is a Columbia innovation, taking microscopes into parts of the city and regional lower income uh, neighborhoods where kids would never see an electron micros microscope. And they can figure that out again. That hasn't been running, of course. And, We'll get back to all of those things. But we'll also, I think, when I think about where we're at, I think it's more about building forward than building back. 
It's more about taking the best of what we've learned online and harvesting again, embracing those parts of the traditions of living a, a full life, you know, physical life, convening with people, traveling to a certain extent, never, I think, as much as we did. And all going around forward, us hatred, all around us there's feet. I thought I'd end with us one of the finest musical moments from our Sunday session. Uh, Reggie Harris, after the uh, George Floyd um, protests, um, was on. He's a great musician, historian, and a great soul. And he sang this song that he had just written. Around us there's hatred, all around us there's fear. Violence touches our lives, and the message is clear. We mourn our martyrs, in our hearts they'll stay. Then we'll sing, we shall overcome, and go on our way. We will not rest, hmm, till the storm is over. Yeah, we will not lay this burden down. Yeah, we will keep each other. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt there. All around us there's love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. So thanks for listening. Um, it's, I also like to step back once in a while and just remind everybody where we're at, where we really are. Uh, thanks to Cassini, one of the great um, innovations of our time heading out through the solar system. Um, caught the snapshot of us from behind Saturn. It's propitious to have this image today when we just landed another device on Mars. Um, we have a lot of work to do to make this planet a little more rational, a little more connected, and to foster better decisions and better conversations going forward. Thanks for listening. This is a way to reach me, and um, I'd be happy to hear questions.